gonna, you're going to really enjoy this. So over to you, John. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm not sure about that nice guy stuff. This is when it stops. All right. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And um, I kind of, I'm not sure about the culture bit. I'm going to talk on creativity. So could we just block that out? I don't know what that's all about. Um, great to be here. Wonderful to be able to uh, talk to you all. Um, and as uh, it, it says up there, if you're really observant, I am actually going to be talking sort of from my book, uh, Hegacy on Creativity. There are no rules. And, and it, I, I, when I do this talk, I always start by saying two things. One, you don't have to agree with everything I say. All right? And the second is, I don't give a shit. So, fine. <laughs> the reason, actually, I did this is that I, I was asked by Thames and Hudson, but I, I, you know, I did a book on advertising, and... I said to them, I'm an art director, not a writer. I've spent my life taking words out, you know. And, but anyway, they convinced me to do it, and, and I quite enjoyed doing it, actually. Uh, and it was quite interesting. But they came back and they said, we'd like you to do another book. And I thought about what I should do it on. And it, it's really fascinated me that, you know, we work in a creative business, whatever business, you know, but we don't, ever really define creativity. A lot of people don't understand creativity. And so I thought what I would do is write a book on creativity. And this talk is not about advertising or anything like that. It's about creativity. And it's how I think you become a better creative person, whether you're an architect, an art director, a writer, a filmmaker, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't care. So it, it, it's essentially about that. And one of the things that, you know, occurs to you when you, you read about, and I have to, I've sat in so many meetings where I've heard, you know, listened to people talking to me about how creativity, creativity works, you know. I think that's, that's not how it works in my world but in, or in my brain. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you often get when the media kind of comment on creativity is, that, is they always like to show somebody sitting on a beanbag Usually they've got a beanie on. Why? I don't know. Fucking idea. But anyway, you know. And um, they've usually got a laptop. Now, let me tell you, first thing, the last place you will ever have an idea is sitting on a beanbag. I promise you. All right? And if you go around most Shoreditch offices, they've all got beanbags, which is why they're not very good at having ideas. They're quite good at tech, you know. Um, so, you know, and, and the media used to portray it like this, you know, a creative office, you know, people sitting on beanbags. Oh, no, no, it doesn't work. So um, I thought this is, there's such a massive amount of ignorance about it uh, that I thought it, it would be worth doing a, a book on it and talking about it. And as I say, you don't have to agree with everything I say, and I've said the other thing, so I don't have to go back over that. So... The first thing is um, defining creativity. How do you find it? You know, th th you can look it up in the dictionary, which is always a good thing to do, actually, when you're doing... Go and look things up in the dictionary, because it's quite good in its precise way of describing things. But there's no real absolute definition of creativity. It's kind of almost anything you want it to be, which is a bit of a problem. Um, so, I kind of have developed my own definition of creativity uh, that has guided me and uh, it works for me and, it, and I'll explain why it works. I mean, the first thing that we must all accept, and I, I know, you know, if you are directly being creative, um, you get people saying to you things like, well, John, you're creative, so therefore. The first thing to say is we are all creative. It is a human state. As sapiens, we are creative. Now, the difference is some of us are now living by doing it. That's the only difference. But we are all creative. That's the first thing you've got to accept. That's you know, it's what separates us out from monkeys, dogs, cats, 
animals, you know, whatever. You know. Dog doesn't get up in the morning and go, I don't know, I think the hair's not quite right today. I think I'm <laughs> going to change it. You know, they don't. They think, what am I going to eat? We are creative. That's fundamental to us. That's the first thing to, to understand. And from that kind of flows a kind of, so a definition of it. And it's my definition, not everybody's definition. And, uh, and as I said, I'll explain to you why I think it's right. But a friend of mine a long time ago said, you know, John, you know, music is the greatest of all art forms. And I said, no, 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 I don't think it is actually. I think it's the second greatest of all art forms. And he sort of looked at me and said, well, what is the greatest of all art forms? And I said, life. Because we are all creative. Life is the greatest of all art forms. And therefore, if you accept that, you don't have to, I define creativity as an expression of self. That, for me, is creativity. It's an expression of self. And from that definition flows everything I believe about creativity, how I work as a creative person, what I do, why I do it, uh, and why it works for me. And, you know, uh, my, my kind of justification for that and why I believe that is absolutely right. If you listen to any, I think, great creative practitioner talking about their work, talking about what inspires them, why they do it, they talk about their experience. They talk about what they're trying to say. It's an expression of you. And I, as I say, I'm going to go in and explain that with a little bit more, in a little bit more detail. Now, the other thing that we have to uh, understand about creativity is there are two types of creativity. There's pure creativity and there's applied creativity. Now, this is something else that when people write about creativity, they don't quite understand. So what do I mean by pure creativity? What is pure creativity? Pure creativity is painting the Mona Lisa. Or it's thinking up The Simpsons. Or it's designing the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Pure piece of creativity. Out of that person's mind comes that idea. That's pure creativity. Now, applied creativity is writing the 30-second episode of The Simpsons. You know the characters, you've got them there, it's a set, da, da, da. now your job is to make it, continue making it more interesting. Or working out how the staircases function within the Bilbao, within the Guggenheim in Bilbao, uh, and what surfaces you have and things like that. Now why that's important is that the sort of people who do pure creativity are sort of slightly different from the ones who do applied creativity. And it doesn't mean, these are not absolutes, you know, this isn't a science. Uh, and some people do sort of cross backwards and forwards. But the important thing to remember is that if you're working on something that I would call pure creativity, attending a brainstorm session is going to be a complete waste of time. A total and utter waste of time. And in fact, whenever I do something like this, and all these people out there as well, I will ask you, do you know any great idea that's come out of a brainstorm session? <laughs> Never, ever, does anybody put their hand up and go, I've got, had a great one. You get to very good, you get to okay, you get to what's happened and been done before, but you never get to truly great. Never. Now, whilst you're sort of thinking about that, we can reel off a thousand ideas out of, out of the mind of somebody, right? Thinking up The Simpsons, like Leonardo da Vinci, like, you know, Michelangelo, like, and start there and keep going forward. But it's very important to understand that. Whereas if you're in applied creativity, the kind of need to sit in a group and work out how the staircases function in, in uh, the Guggenheim in Bilbao is kind of important. Or if you're a group of writers working on The Simpsons, you kind of work together, you bounce off each other, because the idea is there. I've got the idea, my job is now to make it just better. But I've spent most of my career working in pure creativity. You know, the problems of a blank page. 
that's the thing that has driven me. I've got a blank page, what do I do? And, you know, um, we live in a world today where, you know, collaboration is that wonderful word that everybody uses, and it's like, hey, let's all collaborate, you know. You know, the idea, and it kind of comes out of a logical mind, doesn't it? Because it sort of goes, oh, gosh, you know, two people are having a struggle thinking up this idea. Oh, if I get three people into the room, it might be better. And, of course, you all know it's not. But we live in this world where we think collaboration is the answer to everything. Of course we collaborate. Of course we kind of work with people when we've got the idea. We know what direction we're going. We know what we're doing with it. We collaborate. But we don't collaborate, apart from maybe working with a writer or an art director or a lyricist and a musician, something like that, work with two people to kind of create something. But, you know, the idea that you're going to get to great through this kind of consensus meeting is just nonsense. And it, it's proven time and time again. I think, I mean, someone, one of the big sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, research companies have worked out how much the average brainstorming costs and it's it, the waste of money to a company if you think about it you know six people in a room paid I don't know how much uh, if they're in there for an hour you know that's probably a thousand pounds organizing the meeting was probably another thousand pounds to get to average well if you want to do that then that's you know, fine so very important we must define creativity. You, and, and, you know, you've got to work on your thoughts about it. What do I believe? And, and I'll go through this and explain why I think what I, I'm, I'm saying is right. Um, and uh, decide, you know, uh, is it pure? Is it applied? What am I doing here? How am I going to solve this problem? Because that's essentially what creative people are, problem solvers. Um, so, right, so, and I, a lot of this I'm going to say to you, I, I think you'll know, but I don't, I don't apologise at all for kind of saying it and reminding you, because it's fundamentally important. And, you know, for those who are working in advertising, you know, not everybody necessarily is working in advertising. And one of the brilliant things about advertising is the, you know, it's an ideas industry. Um, and and I, I kind of, I was left, very lucky to kind of find it whilst I was at design school. I went to art school, from art school to design school, and whilst I was at London College of Printing, I kind of was introduced to the work of Dordain Birnbach and people like that, and, and I, because I always loved ideas rather than designing. You know, I liked, you know, Univer as a typeface, but for me it wasn't an idea, you know, and I would, you know, shades of blue are very interesting, but it didn't kind of excite me. I like it, nice, good, that's very good, yeah, yeah. But what's the idea? And I, I think we sort of pass it by sometimes without acknowledging it. And why I love it, why it drives everything. It just drives everything, as I'm sure we all know. But there are things about it which are just utterly brilliant. You know, it is the most egalitarian thing you do, having an idea. You don't have to have special permission. You don't need a special certificate. You don't need special equipment. You can do it anywhere, with anybody, and it could change the world. That's an idea. And, you know, I spend, you know, talking to people, and I, you know, I do, and I, I do a lot now with kind of people involved in technology and stuff like that, and they think tech is an idea. And, and they almost say, well, you know, we've got lots of platforms we can work on. And I'm there going, yeah, but what's the idea? And they look at you sometimes in amusement. What? No, no, we're going to go on and we're going to do that. And we've got these platforms and we can Twitter and, you know. And I say, yeah, but what's the idea? And they look at you in a confused way because they've confused a platform with an idea. And, it, and it's a sort of, this happens occasionally when amazing pieces of technology come along, which it has. So... I think remembering, honouring the idea is so fundamental, so crucial that we must always step back and sort of honour it and say this is why it's so important. Um, the next is kind of, I, th I think in a way, and, and this goes back to my thing about, well, if, if you know, creativity is an expression of self, uh, and by the way, this is my talk, so I'm controlling this, so I can say what I like, can't I? Um, then you've got to have a philosophy. What do you believe in? 
What is it you're trying to say? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And I don't think you can be a great creative person if you don't have a set of beliefs. Because that's what guides you. That's what drives you. And again, I go, listen to a great writer talking about their work. Listen to David Hockney talking about his painting. What drives him? Why is he doing it? Why does he believe in that? What's he trying to say? You talk to a filmmaker. What are they trying to say? Why did they do that particular film? Why did they write that script? They have a point of view, and they're trying to put that point of view across. So I think you've got to work out what it is you believe in. And I don't care. You know, even if you're designing swing tickets for a supermarket display, you still have a point of view. What do I, how would I like that to be? And you put yourself into your work, and that is when it possibly becomes great. You put yourself into your work. And I was, I, I, you know, I, I kind of had a, a very long time ago, um, somebody asked me to do a talk about what I look for in, a, in an idea. And, and I sort of kind of went, well, I know something I like. Kind of made a very short talk, so I thought I'd better think about this. God, that's it. And I realized that, that I was driven by this thing, irreverence. I loved irreverence. I loved irreverent ideas. I loved creating irreverent ideas, I, I, I was a great fan of pop art and kind of that, and I, I sort of somehow, I loved irreverence. And, and I, so my talk was about the power of irreverence and how art moved from revering to being irreverent. So the Renaissance, you know, if you're a painter, if you're an artist, your job was to, if you were commissioned by the church or a state or an authority, was to honor that person, honour that state, honour that authority. So, if, you know, you painted the Sistine Chapel, your job was to sort of make people believe. And art had to kind of revere. It was commissioned. And then gradually as society developed, as we began to question much more, we began to be irreverent. And we said, I'm not sure I agree with that. And society began to sort of evolve and question. And the reason, that, for me, that was, that was great was I think Great companies are constantly doing that. They're constantly questioning. They're constantly going, no, it's not like that, it's like this. And I think we live in a constantly evolving, irreverent place uh, and, and environment where you've got to constantly question, well, why should it be like that? It doesn't have to be like that. And I think the other thing that irreverence, for me, did anyway, gave my work a kind of energy and an excitement. Uh, and I love that. And that's it. So that was mine. It doesn't mean, now I don't want you to all go, fuck, I better get myself in a philosophy, Google, quick philosophy. But it will come if you let yourself, let your work come through you, you'll begin to realize you have a point of view. And that will make you a much more interesting creative person. Much, much more. You, you know, you don't just sit there and say, oh, I have ideas. Well, what kind of ideas? What kind of ideas do you like? You know, you've got to make that decision when you're having when you're working. Why is that important? So a philosophy is, I would argue, as I say, whatever you're doing is fundamentally important. And the best people in our industry, in the advertising industry, if we, you know, for those who remember David Abbott, his wonderful work on The Economist and Sainsbury's when he was doing it, it was very David. <laughs> very sort of slightly upper middle class and Volvo, perfect car for him to work on. You know, he never worked on the Skoda, you know. <laughs> oh, you go Dave Trot, those who know Dave. You know, I mean, Dave, you know, <laughs> hello, Tosh, got a new Toshiba. You know, that's Dave. I mean, it's him, you know. And it's great, that. I think that's fantastic. I love it. He is what he is. So, you know, a philosophy is crucial, and, and I think for a successful career, fundamentally important. I think the other thing, too, is um, that, you know, I sort of was at a tech conference about 12 years ago, and I was giving a talk there, and the person in front of me, ahead of me, was talking to the audience and I was waiting to go on. And they were saying, you know, it's amazing now because we can have one-to-one -one conversations and, you know, storytelling. We don't need storytelling anymore. I can go direct to the person, I can talk to them like that, I can sell them what I want. And, you know, I'm waiting to go on and I'm thinking, how does this idiot get a platform? But what really depressed me is I looked at the audience and most of them were nodding in agreement. And you kind of, Jesus, what am I dealing with here, you know? And the reason I put that up, and the reason is that because there was, believe it or not, 
a belief that somehow storytelling didn't matter in the communications industry anymore. And that, you know, we could directly talk to somebody and wasn't that fantastic, get rid of wastage, bring, done it, job done. Well, <clears throat> I could use a few expletives here, but I won't because I'm being filmed. That is so fundamentally stupid that it's almost not worth commenting on, but I will comment on it. There's a wonderful book I would encourage you to read. It's called Sapiens. Anybody read it? Harari's book? Yeah, great book, isn't it? Great book. And uh, you're just scratching your head. You haven't read it. No, no, right, fine. That's all right. You scratch your head. What's he talking about? Um, and in it, the book is about how essentially we, as part of the planet, became the dominant race. And he, and he tracks how we got here. And the first thing, the, fun, the first fundamental shift that happened to our species, sapiens, because that's what we are, sapiens, was that we developed fictive language. Now, why is that important? It is fundamentally important to everything about us. Fictive language is storytelling, for those by the way, having a problem with that word. It's fiction. Um, and monkeys and chimpanzees talk, and they go, oh, look, banana, oh, yeah, that's good. Or they might go, watch out, tiger. And, and they get to about 50, and it all gets too complicated, and they split up, because they can't deal with it anymore. Because we developed fictive language, in other words, storytelling, we were able to bind ourselves together in larger and larger groups. And it didn't matter if I had not met you, we could have shared that, fic that, that story that bound us together. I mean, football clubs are full of it, aren't they? You know, you're a, I better not say Man United or Man City, I've got no idea really here, but you're an Arsenal supporter, even worse. You know? And they share stories, even though they've not met, they know that. And the point about that is, that that meant we could live in larger and larger groups, and that was the very, very foundation of society, that we shared stories together, we bonded together through stories. So the very essence of kind of society, of who we are, how we think, what we do, comes from storytelling. Crucially important. And in terms of communication, therefore, it is absolutely fundamental. I mean, virtually everything you do will be storytelling of some kind or another. Might be minimal, might be big, might be that, but it's storytelling. And it's absolutely crucial to communication. It was Julian Barnes, a novelist, said he actually thinks we're machines to tell stories. You know, the way we actually use our hands and we, we look at people and the way we talk and the way we explain and everything. He's th he describes us as storytelling machines. Uh, and I think he's kind of right with that. So, storytelling is at the very, very foundation of communication. That's what binds us together. So next time, possibly, somebody says you don't need that anymore, just remind them of how we got to where we got to. Um, I think this is, um, you know, I, 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 I now get into a sort of talking about um, the creative process. And I, I think this is, for me, this is about fearlessness. I think if you're operating in a sort of, pure creativity, it's a kind of, it's a very, very, very difficult area to be involved in. And I think if you're working in advertising, like I think if you're probably maybe a fashion designer, a couple of other industries, I think we're in a very, very tough business. But you have to come in every day and you have to have a new idea. And that idea can't be like yesterday's idea. And that's really, really hard. Because there's not a sort of pattern. You know, a lot, of, a lot of creative people, they follow a pattern. They do a kind of, and it works in one way. So, you know, Lichtenstein, the great artist, developed comic book kind of type illustrations, and he went on doing that for the rest of his life. But I think why I've always thought Picasso was such a genius is that he didn't follow patterns. He did something, broke it, stopped, and went on and did something else. I've done cubism. I'm not going to do that anymore. And I think if you're in our industry, if you're doing what we do, and this is where I do apply it to the communications industry, where I say you come in every day and have to have a new idea, you've got to be fearless. You've got to be able to break what you did yesterday and come in with a new idea today and be prepared for people to dislike it, question it, 
kind of think it's rubbish, think it's absolute nonsense, but you've got to stand there and defend it. And that's the way you'll sustain and maintain a creative career. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk again a bit more about that in a moment. But I think, you know, people often say to me, um, John, do you learn from your mistakes? And I say, absolutely not. Never. <laughs> the last thing you ever want to do is worry about your mistakes. I've got loads of them, I can tell you. I've got, you know, oh, Jesus, that was crap. But if I worried about it, if I kind of went, oh, shit, you know, oh, that was a mistake, wasn't it? Now, I'm going to do this again next time. Now, maybe I better not make that mistake again. I'm sunk. It's all over. Because I start worrying about breaking new ground, and you've got to break new ground all the time. And I think you see that with film directors, don't you? You see a film director who's made a great movie, they've got an Oscar, everybody's talking about them, they go on, they make their next movie, and it's absolute shite. <laughs> and, poof, you know, what do they do for their third movie? Do they go, oh, shit, I've got to go back and do something I did for my first movie? Or do they have to go, nope, I'm just going to keep going? And you have to do that, and especially... You know, I think maybe in that industry or if you're in fashion, you just have to keep doing it. You have fearlessness. It's fundamentally important. And mistakes, forget them. If you're a research scientist, I'm sure it's perfectly reasonable. If you're doing a sort of a functional job, very important. You learn from mistakes. Won't do that again. Won't do that. But when you're trying to create something new, what, what do you learn from that mistake I made yesterday? The only thing it will do is it will inhibit you. So forget it. And everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. So what? Who gives a shit? Um, so fearlessness, really fundamentally important. You've got to kind of embrace it and be prepared to be knocked back. Um, I think this is one I, I, I sort of put this in because, again, we kind of live in a world today where we don't, where craft is kind of like considered not necessary or essential. And, you know, I've been in meetings, where, so we don't need to do that anymore. You can just, you know, get, push it out there and, you know, isn't that wonderful? And, and I, I, you know, I do, there's a lovely quote and it goes something like, um, we're all artists, but some of us shouldn't exhibit, you know. And, and I think <laughs> we do live in a world where, quite rightly, as I've said, we're all creative, but for Christ's sake, just let somebody else do it. Like, you know. It's like me, we can all sing. We can all sing. God almighty, if I got up here and sang, I'd clear the room in no time at all. So, you know, there is something we shouldn't do. And I think this sense of anybody can do it is wonderful. The democratization of creativity, after all, we're all creative, so in a sense that's just like nonsense, is brilliant. But in fact, respecting how somebody does something and makes it brilliant has to be understood. Now, I always say, you know, if you think about six people telling a joke, the same joke, only one of them makes it funny. That's called craft. And, and I think we just don't, we don't honour that enough. We live in a world where we view it as not ultimately necessary and clients go, well, we, we don't need to do that anymore. Well, we do. It's fundamental to the idea. Getting it across, the craft of it is absolutely crucial. So, you know, you've got to argue for that and find a way of arguing for why it should be made the way it should be made. And it's interesting, isn't it, in the world of entertainment, they seem to have understood that. They've understood that the craft of what they're doing is fundamentally important to the actual idea. So, you know, Game of Thrones about to come back on our screens. I mean, part of what that makes that amazing, whether you like it or not, is the way it's made, the detail, the craft in it is just absolutely fantastic. And craft in writing, craft in art direction, craft in filmmaking, all fundamentally important. So don't let anybody say to you that's not important. It is absolutely crucial. But, you know, people will be, you'll hear them talking about that. Um, I sort of talk a, a little bit about fame and, uh, and why fame is important. And we were, we're great believers of this at uh, BBH. And, and, you know, when I sort of talk about this, I often get this view from people, oh, God, don't we live in a fame culture? Is that... <laughs> well, don't get fame and celebrity confused. I think we live in a celebrity <coughs> culture. Again, if you look up the dictionary, it will... It will whichever dictionary you look in, one of them describes it as public renown, great esteem, fame. And that's fundamentally important. But the point about it is, certainly in what we do and in what artists do, why fame is important, is it shorthands 
the decision-making process. It intensifies the conversation I can have with you because I understand where you're coming from. Um, and certainly in commercial world, it allows premium pricing and resists competitive pressure. So if you're working in the commercial world, it has real value. But if you're working as a, as a sort of pure creative person, it has value because I've begun to understand what it is you're saying to me. And I always love the, uh, the example I use is when Daniel Craig became Bond and he did the first Casino Royale. You kind of, there are things in movies when you're all waiting for, is he going to ask for it? You know, what's he going to say when shaken or stirred? Is he, what's he going to say? And uh, for those who remember it, I remember it because I thought it was very funny. And uh, they hit the card game, they break, he goes to the bar, he's sitting there, the barman, and he says, vodka martini. And the barman says to him, shaken or stirred. His answer? He looked up at the barman and said, do I look as though I care? <laughs> he was playing with us. Now that is because we all knew the, 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 the phrase, we all knew what he did, <coughs> shaken, not stirred, and he played with us. And that's the genius of fame. I mean, Picasso, any great artist does it. Fame, because you understand where they're coming from. They can shorthand the conversation with you and intensify it and deepen it. And that's what makes fame fundamentally important. And that's why you try and create famous work. Now, the problem you have is when do you leave that particular party? When do you decide to go? Now, there's no formula for that one. Just going back to my Daniel Craig thing, why he will only make one more Bond because he doesn't want to be forever typecast as Bond. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to develop his career. And when you're doing anything, when you're working on any particular project, at what time do you let it go? When do you let go of that and move on to something else? Now, I, you know, I, I, and there's no answer to that. You have to decide yourself, but it is a decision you will have to make. It is a powerful force. It's incredibly important, but don't let it become a trap, which it can be. So, fame, fundamentally important, but at some point, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to leave that party. Um, I, this is kind of my only sort of trick, in a sense, in, in kind of my book on creativity. And, and, it, and I always found, I remember when I went to art school, you kind, of, you kind of knew who was going to be the first one to say to the teacher, how do you make black really black? And, you know, expecting the teacher to go, oh, you put blue in it, or whatever it is. And I always remember this teacher witheringly looked at, this person who said, excuse me, how do you make black more black? And he just said, put it next to white. Uh, uh, and the reason that's a great lesson in creativity is so much great cre creativity is juxtaposing one thing against another thing that shouldn't be there. And we do it all the time. And it's, you know, we often used to say, if we were stuck on an idea, what can we put with something that is so opposite it that it becomes funny? I mean, Monty Python do this all the time. You know, the artists and poets football match, I don't know if you've seen that one. Absolutely hilarious, very funny. I mean, it's just a straight bit of juxtapose that with that. And it's just, that's my only trick here today for, you know, if you get really stuck, I always think, what can I put with something that shouldn't be there? And in that way, you suddenly begin to spark an idea. Because it makes people, you, the, the thing about it is that the brain is trying to resolve it. That's why the surrealists used to do, did this all the time. I mean, McGrip painted a dove flying, but the dove was made out of stone. And your brain's going, but stone, a dove can't fly if it's made out of stone. How does that work? I'm in there. I've got in. I'm in your mind. And that's fundamentally important. So that's what you're trying to do always, you know, get into somebody's mind. So that's my one little trick, and, it, and it's worked for me a huge number of times, I can assure you. Um, I can't remember what this one is. Oh, yes, this one here. Um, right. This is when it gets kind of like this. So, most creative careers last 10 years. Tricky, that. Eight years into your career, I've only got two years left. Oh, fuck, what am I going to do? Um, that's the reality. The question I'm going to answer, hopefully, is how do you turn an eight year, a 10-year career into a 15-year, 20, 30-year career? Uh, but for most people, this doesn't matter. You know, a lot of creative people, it doesn't matter. It didn't, Roy Lichtenstein didn't bother. He just went on doing kind of, you know, 
comic book type art, and it was brilliant, I loved it, I love his work, but he just went on ploughing that field, they had one idea, and he went on working at it. Picasso didn't, he kept moving, he kept changing. Um, and if you're, you know, so if you're in the music business, if you're Mick Jagger, you can go around the world singing Jumping Jack Flash and 30,000 people turn up and pay a vast amount of money to hear you. Well, he wrote that in 1968. I don't think any of those working in advertising, if you, you know, you <laughs> weren't born. If I came in with a 1968 ad and said, this is the answer, they'd throw me out. <laughs> so the question is, therefore, how do you extend that career? What do you do? And... Uh, this is the next bit of my, uh, my talk. So, um, the first thing is take the fucking headphones off, all right? <laughs> yeah, I know it looks cool, you know, walking around your headphones on, I'm listening to who knows what, you know. Isn't that great, you know, absolutely fantastic. You're cutting yourself off. You know, I made a career out of using music. You don't have to walk around with headphones on to use music. The reason why walking around with your headphones on is wrong is you as an artist, if you are an artist, if you're a creative person, you're absorbing all the time. All the time, influence is coming in and you're storing them and they come back out as an idea. If you cut yourself off, you go into this little world, that's it. You're going to diminish, diminish, diminish. You are not feeding that creative soul. I always love this story that Paul Smith, the fashion designer, tells. And uh, he's at Milan Airport, as usual, flight delayed. So he's going, oh, God, back to London, flight delayed. So a number of people around him, <coughs> you know, headphones go on, slump into a sort of coma, listening to whatever they're listening to. He goes for a walk. Not walk around the airport. Oh, I see. He walks around and he looks down and he sees a little lucky charm on the floor falling off somebody's bracelet. And he picks it up, and he's going around, look at this interesting lucky charm, lucky charm. And he goes, oh, that would make a great button for a man's shirt. And his story is, 20,000 shirts later, I thought, that's enough of lucky charm button shirts. <laughs> now, if he'd sat in the chair, slumped in it, he would have not got to that. It looks, you know, and I, I know it's wonderful, I know it's great listening to music, and I've downloaded all this stuff, and I'm streaming, or whatever you might be doing but of cutting yourself off. And you can't do that. It's going to shorten your career. It's going to shorten the things. I mean, Alan Bennett, the great, great writer, talks about overhearing conversations. He just overhears conversations. That's funny. I'm going to write that down. That's very good. You've got to be that. You're an observer. Great creative people are observers. They see, they watch, they listen, and they put things together. You know, I always use this story, of, and, and I've used it a number of times, but I won't, ex apologies for, you know. But I, I, I walk in from where I live in, uh, in London into Soho, where the office is, and I'm walking, I'm coming up to the bus stop. A little old lady's got two heavy bags, and she's come to the bus stop, and she's just put the bags down. And a car has smashed up the backside of another car, just as she put the bags down. And it was fabulous sound effect. And I think, <laughs> I'm going to use that. Now, I had the headphones on, I've seen the old lady, I've seen the bags, I wouldn't have got that sound. That's an idea. Good, I'm going to use that. And that's what you're doing all the time. You're observing, you're, you're absorbing. And that's what keeps you fresh. So, please, I mean, I know I love music, it's, you know, it's been fantastic in my career, but, you know, take the headphones off. I think this is, this is kind of tough too. It's, you know, I, I, I mean, I think if you're in a, creative business, uh, you, you know, you have to be surrounded by other great people. It's just, it sounds elitist, I don't wish it to mean so, I don't, you know, but it is one of the great, one of the things that you have to do. You just have to surround yourself with other great people. It's inspiring. And it's very hard, this. This is one of the hardest things that you have to work on. It's very, very difficult because you might be in a an environment which isn't about, you know, great creativity and that will drag you down. It'll drag you down, drag you down, drag you down. And, it, and because what we're doing is so elusive, you know, you can't, I, you know, if, you know you, and I, if you're studying accountancy, you can go and do accountancy exams and get better as an accountant. And that's great. Or if you're a dentist, you can go and get better as a dentist. If you're a creative person, you've got to, you know, you've got to surround yourself 
with great people because it inspires you. And, and you know, the other thing I always say is that, you know, creativity isn't an occupation. It's a preoccupation. You're doing it all the time. There's no off knob. There's never an off knob. You know, I don't go home and say, I'm not going to be creative anymore, which is makes brainstorm sessions so stupid, you know. No one's going to come in and be creative. Really? You know, you do your best thinking when you're not thinking. That's the great thing. You fed all this stuff in, and suddenly the idea pops out, and people talk about it. Let it flow. Let it come out. So, tough that. It isn't, you know, it's uh, something that a lot of people find hard, but you, you've just got to do it. Um, this is uh, uh, an important point, and, and I, I was listening to somebody talk recently about, you know, they're setting their credit business up, and they talked about, we're not going to have egos, we're not going to have those people in the room with egos and stuff like that. I'm going, what? Of course you are. Ego is I. What do I believe in? Go back to my thing about creativity as an expression of self. I don't want a load of people in a room all nodding at each other and... I want people in there fighting, arguing, shouting. I want people with passion who believe in something. I believe in this. This is what I'm going to do. Ego is fundamentally important. It is I. I believe in this. And that's crucial if you accept, or I think whatever you're doing in creative work, but certainly if you accept my belief that creativity is an expression of self. Why are you arguing for it if you don't care? Oh, I don't care. You can do anything you like. Do something else. I don't know. What do I, I don't want those people in my, my meeting room. I want people who passionately believe in something. And that is what ego is. Again, you know, look at the dictionary definition. So, you know, fundamentally important. However, like all those things in life, there is a downside. And what you don't want is hubris. Hubris is me. Not I, me. Me is more important than you. No, it's not. Ego is what you believe in. That's terrific. It isn't necessarily import, more important than somebody else's point of view. You argue for it passionately, but you've got to be very, very careful that you don't allow ego to drift into hubris. And that will, and that will kill your creativity. So fundamentally important, that. Um, my next point is, um, you know, I, I, I think... Great creative people are optimists. I think they're, you know, I, I, whenever you're doing anything, I, I think you've got to believe that you're, you know, I went back to that thing about an idea, it can change the world. I know I'm, I've got this crappy brief that's going to be only a little thing that's going to run somewhere and only five people are going to see it, but I'm going to change the world with this. I'm going to change the world with this. And, and you know, you've got to be optimistic. Great creative people are optimists. They know that what they're doing is going to make a difference. Pessimism will kill creativity faster than anything. Never be a pessimist. You will never have a great creative career. I mean, we did a, we did a, a wonderful piece of work for Johnny Walker, and the brief was to simply write a, 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 a film that they could run at the distillery when they brought people along to tell them about the history of Johnny Walker. And there was a small little budget for it. And it was, you know, it's not you know, very big. And it was, un, you know, just edit some stuff together. And the creative team went away and thought about it and thought, no, it'd be great to tell this story in a really, really interesting way. Um, and they came back with the man who walked around the world. Uh, and I always forget his name of that act. Yeah, don't know, anyway. But it was told the story, this actor told the story of Johnny Walker from its very early beginnings in one take all the way through. And um, that was a little brief that was nothing and it won a Grand Prix at Cannes because they believed that they could do something with this uh, and make it a fantastic, fantastic piece of uh, communication. They were optimistic about the opportunity. But also just in the way people kind of can be pessimistic in meetings. Mm, don't, don't think that will work. Why? Who said that? Shut up. Let's talk about how brilliant it is and <laughs> see how we can make it work. So, you know, optimism is fundamentally important. Um, the, um, I, I call this, you know, every, every McCartney needs a Lennon. Um, 
And um, you kind of, what happens is your career becomes hopefully more successful. You're starting to do better work and you get a bit of press and suddenly people will think you're a genius and that you walk on water and you're a guru and they use all these bloody stupid words about you and nobody around you will tell you the truth. You know, and I always say every McCartney needs a Lennon. So there's Lennon and McCartney. J Paul McCartney writes some of the most brilliant, brilliant music, breaks up with John Lennon, surrounds himself with yes people and writes the frog song. You know. <laughs> I mean, Paul, fucking hell, what were you thinking? You know, all the mull of Kintyre, you know. If only Lennon had been there, say, Paul, don't do the Muluk inside, you know, it's shite. But he didn't. And that's what happens. You see it, I've seen it, to, to, I've seen this happen to very, very kind of a, applauded creative people. I've seen the kind of people around them, oh, you're a genius, you're really good. No, you're not. You always must have someone who sits there and says, John, that's a load of shit fundamentally important but that will kill your career again you know it's that great line of Shakespeare is the courtiers who kill the king adulation adulation you know and all of a sudden you believe you're a genius no you're not you're quite good but not a genius so fundamentally important and uh, my, my very last slide is this one which is you know ultimately the power of reduction is what makes I think great creative ideas just reduction. And it is how do I reduce that idea down? Because I always say to everybody, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, if you're a filmmaker, a musician, or whatever it is, you know, in the, you're working in the media as we are, whatever, there is only one space that matters. There is only one space. And that's the space between somebody's ears. And that's where your idea is trying to lodge, in between those ears. And if I get in there and the idea then opens out, I have genius. That's what you're trying to do. The rest of it, not on a piece of paper, not on a tablet, not on a screen, not on a... I want it in there. Because if it's got in there, it's opening out and you're playing with it in your mind and I've got you. And that's what you're trying to get an idea to do. So the concept of simplicity is so fundamentally important. I think that's what you know, advertising is particularly brilliant at doing, taking very complex ideas and reducing them down to a single simple thought that goes in and actually opens out inside somebody's brain. And that's what's genius about it. So that ability to get to that state is just fundamentally important. And, uh, and oh, I just want to show one piece of work because I should show something. And I love showing this because if I said to you, I'm, I'm, you know, I want you, the brief is to sell this particular product. By the way, I want you to explain the meaning of life uh, alongside this um, and uh, explain why that's fundamentally important and you've got 60 seconds. You'd go, you must be mad. You know, philosophy books are you know, 500 pages long. How can I do this in 60 seconds? And this, I think, is the genius of what we do. Can you just do that for me? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, let's see, I've got my glasses. Let's see, hopefully we've got volume. There are 60 seconds, we've launched the Xbox and we've told you, explain the meaning of life. Play more. Thank you very much, that was great. Yeah. Thanks John, that was fantastic. Um, John's got about five minutes till he has to rush to get his train, so please feel free to ask him any question that you'd like to. Over to you. 
There must be some. A question there. Yes. Okay. Right, now, before you do that, before you answer, your, ask your question, I'm going to do something. Which is, for asking the first question, you get £20. <laughs> Lesson, be first. <laughs> it's better than being last. Yes, what was the question? It's a shit question, but don't worry about that. Oh, wait a minute, so they get the money. Whoa, blimey, that's a bit heavy and deep, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I've always thought, you know, uh, and the greatest strategy you can ever, ever follow in advertising is tell the truth. It's been, you know, if you look at the great advertising campaigns, you look at the ones which have resonated down through time, it is the ones that have told the truth. And I, I think it's, we have a weird kind of relationship with the truth, don't we? We kind of admire it but we often find it difficult to express it. Uh, but when we see it, we love it. We love somebody who's truthful. We love the way it disarms, what it can do. But the answer, of course, is to make it interesting. And that's what you've got to do. But, uh, you know, I mean, we've always done this thing about when we, whenever we were, you know, a brand had come to us or a client, whatever, and the brand was in trouble, we always went back to the foundation of that. What was it all about? Why did it ever get started? And what truth did it contain? And it was in that that we then developed our thinking. It came out of that. So just tell the truth. You know, it, and, and, it, and the other thing, then, just make it interesting. Do you, do you think like, you know, things have become more transparent because of technology and because of access to information, that the more vulnerable you are, the more honest you are, the more authentic you are, the stronger you are as a brand? Well, I do. I think, actually, bizarrely, technology has not made things more truthful. We have more, we have more untruths around the world. Believe it or not, there are now a considerable number of people who believe the world is flat. You know, I mean, I mean, it's now, and, and technology has allowed this. It's encouraged people to think, you know, this conspiracy theory and the world's flat and they're all wrong. So in fact, the thing that they predicted about this technology was that it was going to unleash the truth. It's, you know, it's unleashed fake news. Uh, and that's one of the great, tragedies. You know, I, I was thinking the other day, actually, I think you can almost say now, don't believe it unless it's printed. If it's printed, you've had to put your name to it. Whereas, you know, anyway, yes. No, you don't, no. <laughs> Second prize, no, sorry. Well, I think I, I, that is actually a very good question. I mean, you, you know, you've got to understand I'm, I'm no, no longer a part of BBH and, you know, obviously my era in advertising is over, although I am still doing lots of things with the United Nations and stuff like that, which is great fun. I really enjoy it. I think it's very, you know, if somebody says to you, oh, it was great back then, it wasn't great back then. It was bloody difficult back then. You know, it wasn't, you know, clients walking, oh, John, yes, we'll make that, of course, yes, you said that was brilliant, therefore we'll go and do it. It was a struggle. It was a constant struggle to get people to buy great work and we had to fight for it and believe in it. And I think the battles just change. I think the battles just change. And I think in many ways... You know, you could argue this is a more exciting time to be in the creative industry because it, it is so easier to do something. You know, I came from a world where it was sort of, you know, it was either a TV spot or a poster or it was a print ad or it was a radio commercial, which was reasonably easy. But they were kind of fairly set, solid areas of communication, whereas now, you know, I, I, I talk about the Johnny Walker idea that we wrote, the man who walked around the world. And we couldn't have done that 25 years ago because it, it wouldn't have got out there. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities. And I always, I always say at BBH, remember, revolutions start at the edges and work in. They don't start at the center. They start at the edges and then work in. So being able to do something really different and distinctive, you can go to clients and say, look, I'm just going to make this short little film. We're going to do that. It won't cost you much. I'm going to get friends and everything. We're going to do it is a great way of 
doing stuff. And I think I love doing stuff. So you can do things today that we couldn't 30 years ago that gives you a great advantage. I think this is actually, you know, I really do mean it, is, is a very exciting time to be in our industry. I mean, and it was different back then. And, but I came into a time when television became the big thing. And there were, you know, because I came in a very, very long time ago, there were people who didn't, thought television was terrible, didn't like it, didn't want to do it. They were poster artists and things like that. And for them, television was a terrible kind of medium, you know, disrupted what they were doing and they hated it. One more, sir. Oh, good. Oh, blimey, I said the same stuff. Did I? Uh, at least I'm consistent. When your book came out, actually. Oh, right. And um, someone asked you at the end whether you thought um, creativity was, London was the place to be and whether, you know, what you thought of the North, of which you, th you, you said at the time that London was the place to be. I wondered whether your thoughts had changed. Well, I'm still in London. Yeah, yeah. no. Well, <laughs> well I, I, I mean, I think it's one of those questions, you know, where... You know, I'm hugely biased, and, and I, I was born in London, brought up in London. I love London. It's a fantastic place. I'm surrounded by some incredible people. But, you know, you know we went and started an agency, our BBH in New York, and, and in, in a way, we should never have gone to New York. We should have gone, you know, all the best creative agencies in America were, were not in New York. They were in Minneapolis, or they were in San Francisco, or they were in Miami, or, you know, they weren't in New York. So you don't have to be in the centre, as I refer to it, because it's a capital city, to be in a great place. You can, be, you can be here, or you can be in Birmingham, or you can be wherever you want to be. But I think the principles of what I'm saying, you know, I would say principles remain, practices change. The principles are still fundamentally true. Surround yourself with great people, surround yourself with great opportunity, you know. So it's, it's wherever you are, do it. All right, one more question, I've got to go. Do you know, funny enough, I, I, I sort of never, not because, I, I was very um, influenced by Bill Birnbach in, in the early days. Uh, but I, I wasn't really so much him. That I loved his work. And I, I think I've, I've, ten, I've tended to meet a lot of, I've met a lot of famous people and I've been very disappointed by a lot of famous people. And, but I love their work. And I, I've always said, love the idea. You know, love, just fall in love with the idea. Forget, you know, that, that they did it. And, and I think there is a thing about don't, you know, don't meet your heroes, you'll only be disappointed, but love what they create. And I've always tried to do that. I've always tried to sort of love the things that people produce. Um, and then you're, not, you're never let down. And as I say, as it's an expression of self, you have met them. You know, that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you again to John. That was absolutely fantastic. Don't forget what I said. If you think you've had a fantastic time tonight, you still have donations. <laughs> Money! Ask, and buy my book, by the way. And yes, it's absolutely it. brilliant. <laughs> 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 Yeah, there you are, your first donation. <laughs> yeah, oh, lovely, thanks, that's great. Right, your phone is over there. Yeah, I mustn't forget that, and I must get...